Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Greetings to our audience here in person and to our audience online, uh, both here in Washington and out in Tokyo uh, and beyond. Uh, I'm Chris Johnstone. I'm Senior Advisor and Japan Chair uh, here at CSIS, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our event today focused on uh, Japan's defense priorities. Uh, as everyone knows, Japan's new national security strategy, new national defense strategy, and defense procurement plan were all released in December 2022, and together they collectively chart a new course for Japan's strategic trajectory in response to an increasingly complex uh, security environment across Asia. And so today, with a grant from the government of Japan, uh, the Japan chair invited a group of experts uh, from Japan and the United States to analyze Japan's new defense strategy and identify key priorities from an alliance perspective over the medium term. In other words, not just the next year or two, but the next three to five, uh, as the Japanese government seeks to strengthen its defense capabilities and coordinate uh, more closely with the United States and other like-minded partners. So we commissioned research from eight experts uh, and invited U.S. and Japanese perspectives on a number of key themes. Uh, which we will discuss today. Uh, the first is uh, priorities uh, in uh, Japan's defense strategy and new capabilities and other considerations from, a, from an alliance perspective. Uh, and we have Heino Klink, former da uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for East Asia, uh, Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia with us today, along with uh, Hikotani Takako, a professor at Gakushuin uh, University. We'll next uh, cover the future of Alliance command and control, I think a really pivotal uh, issue for the future of the Alliance. And I'm very pleased to be joined by retired Rear Admiral uh, Mark, Mark Montgomery, Senior Director and Senior Fellow from the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at the Foundation for the Defense of, of Democracy, uh, and Lieutenant General retired uh, Koichi Sobe, who's a lecturer at the Joint Staff College but had a, had a number of very senior positions uh, in the ground self-defense forces before retiring a few years ago. We'll then move on to a, a concentrated discussion on space uh, with uh, Sadia Pekkanen, professor and founding director of the Space Law Data and Policy Program uh, and founding director of the Qualitative Multi-Methods Program at the University of Washington, uh, and Kazuto Suzuki, who will join us virtually from Tokyo uh, who's, a, who's a University of uh, Tokyo professor uh, and one of Japan's leading experts on space policy. And then for our final two uh, presenters, we'll have Lisa Curtis, uh, Senior Fellow and Director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for New American Security, uh, and Hideshi Tokuchi, President of the Research Institute for Peace and Security, RIPS, uh, in Japan, and himself a former senior official of the Ministry of Defense. They will discuss uh, the um, uh, advancing a, a networked security architecture. So the idea of nesting the U.S.-Japan alliance in a larger uh, regional context. Uh, I'm delighted that all eight of them have been able uh, to join us today in this hybrid format. Uh, we hope that this, this discussion we'll have today, which will cover uh, a lot of ground in a short period of time, but it's our hope that this will whet your interest in reviewing the essays that our experts have produced, which will be published in a collection uh, by CSIS uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so we've divided this group into two panels, uh, the first of which, which I will chair, uh, will focus on uh, the broad priorities and capabilities question, uh, and then the command and control question, and then after a short break, uh, my colleague Nick Seicheney uh, will moderate the second panel on uh, new domains and alliance networking. Uh, so with that, um, uh, and maybe one last point to sort of in entice you, uh, there's a reception afterwards in the foyer that everyone's welcome to join. Um, so with that, I'll invite our first group to the stage and we'll get started in our, in our discussion. Thank you.
uh, with a discussion of um, priorities from an alliance perspective. Uh, and then we'll move to command and control. And what I'd like to do is invite Professor Hikotani uh, to get us started. And by way, we have a little bit more background on her. Um, she's previously taught at the National Defense Academy, lectured at the Ground Self uh, Defense Force and Air Self Defense Force Staff Colleges, and the National Institute for Defense Studies. Um, and her research focuses on civil military relations uh, and Japanese domestic politics. And then she'll be followed by uh, uh, former DASD Klink, um, who is a global strategist, business executive, retired Army U.S. Colonel, and as I said, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. So without further ado, uh, Hikutani Sensei, please. Um, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm excited to come to CSAS for the first time, actually, and that um, it's such a great panel to be on. Um, and I'm, so I'm not too sure what I can add, but I'd like to share my um, thoughts about civil military relations, especially on the Japan side. Um, what I mean here by civil military relations is not just about who decides or who's in the decision-making process per se. Um, but I would I'd like to point out that in, the, in a democratic country like ours, it should be also about what, how the public plays a role, not just in the decision making, but also in the questions of who serves, who fights for the country, who pays, and what the military does. Um, but for today, I'll focus on the who fights aspect and the alliance aspect. Um, and, and I would like to make four points. One, about why the public should matter more in U.S.-Japan relations and why, and why now. Um, to what the recent opinion polls should tell us about how people think about the alliance and the role station play, and the policy implications and the policy suggestions. And I'm, my bottom line up front is that while the U.S.-Japan feelings towards each other between the two countries is very positive, and support of the alliance for the alliance is very strong, there is a growing accept and, and there is a growing acceptance of J in Japan for a greater defense spending and roles for the South Defense Force. I think there's a couple of things we need to take into account to be something to think about. Is that one in both countries, public opinion may not have caught up with the elite opinion about the urgency of the security environment or the expe expected evolution of alliance, and there might be an expectation gap be um, uh, between the two countries about what roles the militaries would play for the alliance, and that I would argue that we shouldn't underestimate the public, which I think is pretty pragmatic, and that we should think about what ex experts uh, like us can do to mitigate the concerns about the expectation gap. Um, so why public opinion? Um, you might be wondering why do we th have to think about that because it's basically positive on all ends. At the government level, I think U.S.-Japan has never been on the same page as we were. Um, and the Japan's NSS is a very good to-do list in a way and an honest discussion about what is necessary as a real fighting force for Japan. And the general public, the impressions of each other is very positive. Confidence in the military is high in both countries. And there's a general support of ongoing policy in the U.S. There's a support for U.S. bases um, abroad. And that um, there has been support for alliance and defense spending um, is growing. But precisely because of the general positive situation, I think is a perfect moment for us to ask the hard questions and about the alliance and include more people in the discussion. And I think it's a really good time right now because in the U.S. there's going to be the elections happening and there will be more discussions about the partisan differences. There's already been discussions about what role the U.S. should play in Ukraine and there has been discussion about China, but not really so much about what exactly the U.S. is going to be doing in alliance. And also from my experience teaching more recently at Columbia and, and at UCSD, I wonder um, if the younger generation in the U.S. is thinking about U.S. role in the world in general to be as it was decades ago, and they might be thinking about something different. And what does that mean? And how about Japan? Um, I think the salience of security issues is up, and that I think the Ukraine war was a lot of, in many ways, a turning point. I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs titled How the Ukraine War is Changing Japan in April last year, and I didn't really like the subtitle that the editors put on, which is that Japan is um, shifting towards an assertive security strategy, and I thought, I don't really mean that, but then I, maybe I should send a thank you note because I look like I was right. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, so, and I think Premise Kishida has been taking the opportunity to say to the Japanese public, the world only helps those who help themselves and not to take peace for granted. But how exactly has that turned it to people understanding what that means. And I think the people aspect has not been emphasized enough. Um, and so, and I think it's also important for the roles and missions part of the U.S.-Japan alliances too. So um, what, 
And I think the additional concern is that contingencies around may not be as clear, and the diet or the um, or legislature may not come to a quick agreement on what a given contingency means for Japan and what the appropriate response may be. So although we can have confidence in that probably um, the same party will be in power, and since they have the numbers, they can probably pass the diet process, I think the sort of the tendency to think when push comes to shove, the Japanese public is going to wake up. It's not a really healthy thing. It's better if the public is actually on board and not just be shoved over. Um, so what recent polls tells, tell us about the alliance that makes me think that we should look at this issue? I'm looking at the recently published cabinet office poll, which is the most sort of a reliable poll that the Japanese government has done. And they, the most recent one was um, presented March 7th of the one that was done in November and in December 2022. So that's post-Ukraine. And also the Chicago Council for Global Affairs poll, which one of which they did jointly with the Japan Institute for International Affairs, that I think is very interesting. So I'm going to go to those two. And I'm going to make three points, three observations from the polls. One um, is that is the Japanese public willing to fight? And I think there's an off-sited a world value survey that Japan amongst last or lowest among 79 countries in terms of their willingness to fight. Um, but I think we have to kind of look into what exactly that means. And because in a way, it's, we're kind of fortunate that we don't have to have people thinking about that. But um, in the cabinet administrative office poll, I think it's interesting to note that overall only 4.7% will join the self-defense force if Japan is made by another country, but 51% would actually support the self-defense force in the way they can. So it's not that they're not really not interested. And I, was, I thought it was striking in the most recent poll that in the age range of 30 to 39, 11.7% um, said that they'll join. And that was really surprising to me. And also, just in terms of our experts in the room, um, I think the, we, we should note that uh, Tokyo ranks the lowest, that only 1% says they will, but it's actually higher in the regional area. So we might be having a different image if we only talk to people in Tokyo. But also the other thing is that there hasn't been that much change since 2006, so this is not a recent event. So in a way, we have to be a little bit more nuanced about how we think about Japan in that sense. But what concerns me more is about um, the U.S.-Japan alliance and how people look at it. So yes, 89% says that U.S.-Japan alliance contributes to the peace and security of Japan. That number has been very always high. But if you break down the yes number, and the Ministry of Defense always aggregates those two, the yes answer is 31.1%, and the relatively speaking yes is 50%. So the support um, in the, in the um, public is actually a little bit softer. And I've done polls of civil and elite and self-defense force officers in 2004 and 2014 when we asked the same question. The support among the civil and elite and the self-defense force, they are much more likely to say just yes. So I think those are the people we're surrounded by, and we might think that other people are saying yes, but it's actually a little bit more trickier, that is more relatively speaking. And also it's much lower among the women, for whatever reason. <laughs> um, and that, um, and so, but the other good news maybe is that what is the best way to keep Japan safe? Um, and the choices are U.S.-Japan alliance, only self-defense force, or no self-defense force to U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, now it's 90.9% in 2013, which is up 10% almost since 2018. So people think of it as the choice to go forward, and that's much stronger. And it's interesting that women support that even more than men on this regard, so they think it's a good idea. But I guess with the concern part that I'd like to highlight today is in the Chicago Council, JIA poll, and that's about the actions of the self-defense forces. When, um, the question is, do you think the South Defense Forces should do the following things in its military cooperation with the United States? Um, as for the question of providing logistic support other than weapons and ammunitions to U.S. troops off the battlefield, 40% says yes. Providing weapons and ammunitions to U.S. troops off the battlefield is 27%. Providing weapons and ammunitions to U.S. troops on, on the battlefield is 28, 20%. Fighting with U.S. troops against enemy on the battlefield is 15%. And that's, uh, I think, is very telling. So I think there's a um, the the takeaway is that U.S. Japan alliance is considered the best way to go, but there isn't really that much of an expectation of role of the self-defense force in the fighting sphere, and I think that's something to note. Um, third, uh, what about the U.S. views? Um, so as I said, support for bases and U.S. base presence is very strong, um, but there are some differences at, uh, between the elite and the public, and this is actually um, both Republican and, and Democrat, that on the question of would you favor or oppose the uh, the use of U.S. porphys if China invades Taiwan. So that's a pretty big if. 85% um, of the Republican leader says yes, um, and about half, 43% of the Republican public says yes. Um, same, it's sort of the same for Democrats, 63% yes for the elites or the leaders, and 40% for the public. So there's a gap there. 
And also the interesting contrast is between U.S.-Japan about possible U.S.-Japan difference on who takes the lead. 47% um, of the Japanese publics want, uh, expects the U.S. to take a dominant leadership, whereas it's 23% for the U.S. And that 69% um, of the U.S. says they, that they expect a shared leadership role as opposed to 49% for Japan. So, the, so um, what is the upshot of all that? One is that the, the support for the alliance is very strong. You, Japan sees no other option. Uh, Japan expects the U.S. to play a dominant role. The U.S. is more ambivalent about taking a leading role. Um, there's partisan differences in the U.S. and there's a possible public elite divergence in both countries about the intensity of support. Um, is this a problem? Um, of course, you know, the um, one thing about the Chicago Council poll, there's hasn't, the most recent one is yet to be published. So there might be some difference in Ukraine, but I was just visiting um, earlier this week and I've been told that there hasn't been that much change on the Japan side. Um, and that, um, so the takeaway is that the NSS is really pretty ambitious and it's going to be about Japan being a fighting force, but the public may not quite see it that way yet. Um, there might be expectation gap that I kind of worried about, about the possible disappointments. Um, and Japan's expectation is very high on the U.S. role in the abstract, and I'm not too sure how in a concrete way Japan will be able to contribute at this point at the public opinion level. And when we think about Taiwan, I'm not going to go into, into details, we can think about different scenarios where the public might disagree. So what can we do about it as experts in the room? And I think expectation management without, um, the Japanese saying for this is inviting snake from the bush. So you don't want to rattle things in a way. And I think in the English expression is let the sleeping dog lie is one way to look at it. But I do think you have to wake some people up. And I do think in letting, like ignoring the fact that there might be a gap is not helpful. I'm not exactly sure how, but I do think I think there's a role for experts to play to actually talk about these things more frankly with the public when the support for the alliance is very low, uh, very high. Thank you very much. That's great, Hikotani Sensei. I mean, I think a very important point that as ambitious as Japan's national security strategy is, that the public has not yet perhaps caught up to the to the vision that's that's set out there. So. Um, interesting sort of first order question for us to think about. Uh, let me now turn to, uh, to Haino uh, to dis discuss uh, uh, capabilities from a priority perspective. Thank you very much, Chris, and to the whole team, Nick, Lauren, Leah, for putting all this together. Um, and really at a pivotal time in the bilateral relationship. Uh, when we think back to you know, Japanuary very recently, when you know most of the, the Japanese cabinet um, showed up in D.C. and all the monumental announcements that were made, I, you know it. it uh, as an American, quite frankly, I'm, I'm proud to consider Japan our closest ally in the region. Um, and when I also think about when uh, when Chris and I were in the Pentagon together. A lot of the things that um, Japanese leaders are now saying publicly, back then was only said behind closed doors. So I can only applaud uh, both the rhetoric that's coming out of Tokyo, plus the actions and the commitments that have been made as outlined in the national security strategy and national defense strategy. And it is a very, very ambitious agenda. And my comments uh, today are going to be focused on, with all these priorities, you know, what, you know, should they be necked down a little bit uh, in the next several years? Because if everything's a priority, you know, the reality is nothing really is a priority. And again, I want to underscore at the onset th that the actions Tokyo has taken are monumental, historic, and unprecedented, and they strengthen the alliance. And for that, again, as an American, as a partner of Japan, I'm grateful. But I would also offer some counsel as to what to actually prioritize in the near term. And what I've done basically is zeroed in on three overarching categories. The first being command and control, and I won't get into all the nitty gritty because I know my colleagues are gonna be talking about that. Uh, the second are strike capabilities and the th third would be readiness. So within command and control, what I would offer is first and foremost, and right now, and when I say right now, I mean within the next 12 months, the Japanese should in fact establish a joint headquarters as has already been uh, discussed in these uh, defense documents. And even if it's not fully manned, 
even if it's a provisional status, that headquarters should be established literally within the next 12 months in order to show a commitment to um, actually implementing some of the decisions that have been proposed. This headquarters should be truly joint, meaning all the services should be represented. Um, it should also offer a venue such as in our combatant commands for foreign liaison officers and exchange officers um, from, uh, yes, obviously the United States, but also other regional allies and perhaps even some European allies given uh, the growing interaction between European and Japanese armed forces. Now the U.S. can help facilitate some of that, I think, in terms of looking at its own headquarters in Japan, U.S. Forces Japan, and perhaps looking at how that headquarters uh, should be expanded, not just in terms of personnel, but also in missions and authorities, so that uh, the engagement, the interaction, and, and uh, to a certain extent, some integration occurs as well. And there might be some aspects of the Combined Forces uh, Command in Korea that could serve as a model. I would also say, uh, fully cognizant that this is approaching a third rail in Japan, that uh, the Japanese armed forces need to start talking to counterparts on Taiwan. It doesn't have to be done publicly. It can be done on a low-profile manner. If the Americans need to facilitate to make the Japanese more comfortable, we should be willing to do that. But given the fact that the most dangerous scenario in the region involves conflict over Taiwan uh, with the PLA, I think it's in Japan's interest to actually start establishing relationships on Taiwan now as opposed to waiting for a crisis to occur. Again, having a headquarters that is integrated and connected w both within the service model of the Japanese Self-Defense Force but also with foreign counterparts is fundamental to other command and control uh, issues that should be addressed by technologies and capabilities. But you have to have this headquarters, I think, at least in part set up in order to facilitate things like sensitive shooter integration and systems uh, compatibility and interoperability. So that leads me to two very specific recommendations for the acquisition of uh, C2 systems. I think the United States should facilitate an acquisition by the Japanese of what's referred to as CEC, the Cooperative Engagement Capability, to serve as a sensor network for integrated fire control and target the Japanese have Aegis, the Japanese have E2D systems that we have also. We need to be able to communicate. Um, if we have systems that op not just operate together but can communicate together, then you have greater coverage, additional standoff, more effective fire control, and you enhance interoperability. So that's a very specific recommendation. This is something that's been uh, talked about for many, many years, and I think, uh, and part of the issue has been releasability from the U.S. side. The U.S. needs to come up with a solution that allows Japanese access to this, to this system. Additionally, in the same vein, uh, Japan should acquire the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System, known as IBCS. This is a system that's now being fielded in the U.S. and in Poland. It offers an open architecture that allows uh, the integration of any sensor and best shooter would allow, for instance, the integration of uh, the Japanese Aerospace Defense Ground Environment, JAJ. And in, in essence, what it does is it's, uh, for someone such as myself who was a history major, not an engineer, it allows you to plug and play different systems and it, in essence allows you to you know, take two plus two and make it greater than four. Um, and this is a system that is available now it will, uh, it's again, it's being fielded, and I think Japan needs to prioritize acquisition of this as well. So let's talk about strike capabilities. This is something that's been at the fore for a while now as well. And uh, as we've seen in Ukraine, um, you know, the international community has done a lot of great things since last February, February of 2022, but we have to also remember that deterrence actually failed we failed to deter the Russians from invading. And I would argue that we can't afford to fail um, deterring the Chinese from aggressive action, and I or, or the North Koreans for that matter. And I think part of that is a, a 
expeditious procurement of strike capabilities for the Japanese Self-Defense Force. It's been reported, reported that the, the Japanese are looking at acquiring 400 TLAMs, um, a lot of countries in line for uh, Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles, including it was just uh, recently reported Australia's put an order in. Um, so w this only highlights the fact that the United States defense industrial base is, uh, is fragile, to say the least, and we need to think about how we can facilitate the priority acquisition by allies such as Japan of, of such capabilities, including things like bulk orders, for instance. Uh, the same thing applies to uh, El Razm, Jasm ER, Naval Strike Missile, of a, a, a wide variety of uh, munitions that the United States also has a very high demand for. And beyond just the Japanese prioritizing these acquisitions and uh, providing obviously the funding line for this, the United States needs to look uh, more closely at trying to replicate uh, the success of, for instance, the co-development and co-production of SM3 Block 2A and applying that to other types of uh, sy systems capabilities. Um, the U.S. role in this has to be, in, as well, a reform of the current ITAR system, um, tech release issues, and other speed bumps, to say the least, to being able to ensure that our allies with the United States are, are able to produce uh, the munitions and other types of defense technologies that we need. And again, the conflict in Ukraine has only underscored how important that is. And then lastly, I would make some overarching co uh, comments about readiness. And I think some of this may actually also um, be tangentially related to Japanese public opinion. Well, maybe more than tangential, but based on my experience. Um, training. Um, I, th I think it's time for the government of Japan um, to take a look at how not just the Japanese Self-Defense Force is allowed to train in the Japanese islands, but also U.S. Forces Japan. And um, the reality is, and I used to use this analogy all the time, and as a matter of fact, people who have been in meetings with me are probably sick of it, but you know, for many years, even prior to the announcements made late last year in January this year, um, Japan had invested in high-end systems like F-35 and others, made major investments in defense capabilities. But training restrictions in the Japanese islands uh, was almost like buying a Maserati, investing in a Maserati, and then only driving it in downtown Tokyo. Um, and again, as a history major, that analogy resonated with me. That's why I keep using it. And of course, as a former American soldier who uh, spent a lot of time talking to uh, American military leadership in Japan, there was a, a growing level of frustration to the restrictions, not just on, on their forces, but on Japanese forces, and the implications thereof. The number one in, uh, implication is you have to be ready for a high-end war fight today. That's the number one implication. The second implication, I would argue, is that the additional expenditure forcing Americans and Japanese as well to go somewhere else, meaning outside of Japan, to train the way they should train given uh, the operational requirements and given the actual capabilities of, cap uh, of, of aircraft, for instance, and other, um, and other platforms, you know, the, there's an opportunity cost there. So this needs to be addressed. This obviously is a big deal in Japan given, you know, the almost constant cycle of local elections. Um, so, but this is a conversation I think that needs to be had. It needs to be had soon. And then I would also say with respect to logistics as a subcomponent, if you will, of readiness. And again, there are actions taking place already, but I would say they need to be expedited. More and more um, supplies need to be pre-positioned in the Southwest Islands, whether it's simple things such as food and water, uh, but beyond that, uh, 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 POL, munitions and the like. Because again, what you don't want is a contingency to occur and those things are not there. What you want is to have stockpiles of all these things there now, and I think these things can be done relatively easily so that units can just fall in on that. And then lastly, what I would say is again, uh, you know, 
speaking of third rails, I think there needs to be a mature conversation between the United States and Japan behind closed doors about American force posture in Japan and whether the decisions that were made basically a dozen or so years ago uh, under the auspices of the Defense Posture Realignment Initiative, D, uh, DPRI, are actually still valid today. I would argue that the strategic context and the security situation of a dozen years ago is no more and we find ourselves in a much more perilous position. I understand, again, the sensitivity of this issue. That's why I say conversations need to happen behind closed doors, but I think uh, the conversations do need to be had. I'll stop there. Thanks, Haino. That's a good, I think, segue into our next topic, but hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to you on this um, uh, question of adjustments to U.S. force posture, because I think it's an, an interesting area. Let's move quickly, given the time, to our next topic, and that is the future of command and control in the U.S.-Japan alliance. From my point of view, I think this is one of the critical near-term issues as we think about the prospect of a more integrated alliance uh, enabling the full capability of that alliance as Japan um, invests more significantly in its defense, uh, I think is a, is a very important issue for us. Uh, and again, we have two, I think, terrific presenters on this. First, we'll have uh, retired Rear Admiral uh, Mark Montgomery, who, as I said, Senior Director and Senior Fellow at the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, uh, but had a 32-year career in the Navy. Uh, and I got to know him when he was uh, the J3 at Indo-PACOM. So it brings a real, I think, deep understanding of how uh, alliance relationships work uh, at the ground or sea level, if you will. And then um, after, after Mark, we'll have uh, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Isobe, retired again from the uh, ground self-defense forces who had a 35-year career uh, in the ground self-defense force in a number of senior positions and is one of the leading thinkers on the future of Japan's defense strategy. Uh, so without further ado, Mark, over to you. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. And I'm really you know, happy to be on this uh, august panel. Um, well, listen, uh, I'd open my remarks by saying that over the weekend I was in a war game down in, uh, in Florida, and uh, a Taiwan war game, unclassified. And one of the biggest outcomes of the game, in my mind, was that the introduction of integrated Japanese military forces, in other words, fighting alongside the United States, each time that scenario was run, uh, the U.S. casualty rates were down 30 percent. Um, so on average, that was about uh, 5,000 people, 5,000 5, less U.S. casualties. Now, the, the whole number of 5,000 might be wrong, but I, the percentage of 30 percent was pretty consistent. Um, that's meaningful. Uh, I'd also imagine the casualty rates for Japanese forces would be greatly reduced if the U.S. was integrated in fighting alongside them in a counter Senkaku campaign, probably even more than 30 percent reductions. Um, so this is not an academic exercise for either country. If we have integrated forces, we're going to be more likely to win, and we're going to be more likely to win well. Uh, and, and this is important because the aspects of the operational environment that drive command and control development have really changed for us. Things, uh, we are in a more pressing condition. Uh, this is because of Chinese investments uh, over the last 25 years that have been impressive and very direct at driving the United States uh, so that we can no longer operate um, safely inside the first island chain. And in fact, we're challenged to operate inside the second island chain. Um, uh, the Chinese really do have the ability to seize regional objectives and blunt U.S. responses um, as things stand today. I'm not sure about 2027, uh, Admiral Davidson's a friend and I, I respect his decision, his thinking, but 2027 you know, could be 2026, it could be 2028. Um, we get a vote. We can make decisions that move that timeline where we want and we'll talk about some of those decisions. I also think China has very effectively used the gray zone. Whether you're talking about the, the, the more obvious cases, the South China Sea where you know, they built, uh, you know, they, they created islands out of uh, non-territorial, um, non uh, um, below mean low seawater rocks, um, claiming initially they were, you know, so they could, for stranded fishermen to go to, that was the first two years. The next two years was, well, we'll put Coast Guard units there. Pretty famously in 2015, President Xi came to the Rose Garden and, and convinced President Obama that, this, that we would not militarize them. Well, we now have seven fully functional naval bases, five fully functional 
um, airfields that can operate, uh, you know, fighter and bomber jets uh, pr pretty, pretty effectively. So that kind of gray zone. The gray zone we don't think about is what's happening in the East China Sea, where there's this constant salami slicing or constricting, where the Chinese operate initially 100 miles off of the Senkakus five times a year. Then the next year it was 10 times a year, but 70 miles on the Senkakus, and that they've penetrated the 24-mile security zone, and now they're up against and penetrating the 12-mile territorial waters with both air and, and maritime uh, uh, assets. That kind of gray zone operation where you almost don't notice the, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, violation of your territorial integrity. And, and uh, China's not inhibited by alliance challenges. I mean, they don't have too many allies. It's hard to be inhibited by them. They have one, North Korea, that can probably pay like a, play like a pretty good spoiler role. So they don't really have that problem. And then you flip the script on Japan and the United States, and that's what we are. We are an alliance. We are our strongest support to each other. We are always, as uh, I just said, um, you know, we're always trying to make two plus two equal five by operating together. And uh, that alliance and partnerships has to be what drives us towards a better uh, command and control development. And, and then finally, we're going to have to operate seamlessly uh, with both mobility maneuver and striking power if we're going to deter China, convince China not to do anything, or if, if the worst does happen, defeat China in one of these um, episodes. Um, I mentioned pretty, I've talked with Chris about this before, but I try to think about the attributes of military command and control like this. The, the U.S., when we look at allies and partners around the world, has four levels. The first level is deconflicted. That's the lowest level. That means you go left, I go right. Don't, please don't go right or I might shoot you. Um, and that's where two plus two equals three. You're actually worse, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're less effective than, than you'd expect. The next level is, is coordinated, where you begin to talk with each other. You go left at 11 o'clock, I'm going right at 11.01, and I might get a little farther because you distracted them. Mm -hmm. That's where two plus two starts to equal four. Mm -hmm. The third level above that's integrated, where you go left at, at 11, and at 11.15, I'm going to come in on top of you uh, and really magnify things. That's where two plus two starts to equal five. And the final level is unified. I mean, we've achieved unified. That's where you have almost the same forces, almost the same rules of engagement, the same objectives, you know, in World War II with the United Kingdom, you know, we're close to that, uh, you know, if Australia were to agree with us on a political objective, because of our amazing alignment of forces and rules of engagement, we'd probably be there with Australia. I'm not sure who the adversary is there, but you know, with Australia. Um, you know, we are, the U.S. and Japan in that, in that realm, the, the, the Kaijo Jetai, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and the U.S. Navy are actually, you know, moving between coordinated and integrated. And that's because, as, as was mentioned, you know, there's trouble operating, you know, once you go out to sea, there's no more constrict, you know, local pre prefecture constrictions. Um, uh, there's no political bosses watching you. Uh, you know, for the last 20 years, we have very aggressively, I think, moved our navies very close to integrated. Plus, we have the same kit in a lot of ways. The same weapon systems predominate our, our frontline ships. Um, the Air Force is a little below that, and then the ground force is uh, below that as well, but all moving in the right direction. As a point of, of departure for this, uh, in, with Taiwan, the U.S. and Taiwan are completely just deconflicted. They're on ground, air, naval. We just ordered, for 10 years, Congress has been asking DOD to conduct exercise, air and naval exercises with Taiwan, and DOD, for political reasons, has chosen not to. So in this year's National Defense Authorization Act, the one signed a few months ago, they were ordered to do it by this October to, to have the, the plan for the, those. And that will start to drive us off of deconflicted. But also Japan and Taiwan are deconflicted. So the question then becomes, how do you move between these levels of cooperation? Organizations important. There are things you, that you can, you can, there are things you can do, like, or purchase, like organization. And we talked about Joint Force Headquarters there. The United, again, in the National Defense Authorization Act, after asking for several years, for the Department of Defense to set up a joint task force for this region, they've been ordered to set one up. I think that will go along very nicely with the, with the, uh, with the Japanese Joint Force headquarters that comes online in the next year. The second C2 networks, I got some good news. The, the Japanese do have C2 on their destroyers now, two of their destroyers, but they did not get it for their E2Ds, the first four airframes. I'm hoping with the fifth airframe we get it. For, for background, CEC, which uh, the cooperative engagement capability, is really like JADC2 before we thought of the name JADC2. And ironically, we've had it for 30 plus years. 
which is one of the kind of the ironies in the U.S. government is that we can't possibly look back and pick up a good product and, and use it. But I'll just say right now our air and na our naval forces and our naval aviation forces and the Japanese naval forces can pass what's called fire and quality track data, which really improves your ability to shoot things down. And I'm hoping soon the the JASDIF, Japanese Air Self-Defense Force, E2Ds will have that same system. I'll tell you honestly, the reason they don't now is the U.S. Air Force didn't like the program and whispered in their Japanese counterparts' ears, you don't need it, which was obviously sad and wrong. Um, then the other thing you need to do is you need to train and exercise together. We do that, but we really need to continue to move that with aggressive rules of engagement. And then we really have to train the political end of the decision making. Because one of the things I see in these war games is, um, you, know, you have to decide to operate together early. If you don't, and the U.S. is just using Japanese bases to fly from, Jap Japan's going to enter the war, but they're only they're going to enter the war because they've just been hammered by 12 or 1,400 short-range and intermediate-range ballistic missiles that destroy the Japanese air self-defense force on the ground and destroy the Japanese maritime self-defense force in their ports. So the Japanese have to early on understand that when we're using their airfields, which is going to be very likely in a conflict, that the, they're going to be in this conflict. And, uh, you know, I think there's good reasons for that, but that kind of integration is something we have to think about, that kind of rules engagement is something we have to think about. And we train and exercise it, and it means you can't just do the mil military to military, but you have to elevate this to the political military, so you're working your way through that conundrum. Ch China cannot afford to have the United States operating from Japanese airfields without putting those airfields at risk with missile attacks. It's just that we're too good if you give us a very, very, very large aircraft carrier effectively several hundred miles off of Taiwan, which is what Japan would serve as. So, you know, from that point of view, we really have to exercise and work well together. I think there's a lot of opportunities on this. I think there's a lot of opportunities in that network and, and integration. I think there's opportunities in organization. I look forward to discussing them in the Q&A. Thanks, Mark. Terrific. General Isobe. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and the, thank you very much for inviting me to this CSIS public event. Uh, my talk uh, is based on my experience as director J5, Japan Joint Staff, uh, especially during the Operation Tomodachi, uh, 2011 uh, disaster relief operations of Great Eastern Japan earthquake and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear uh, power plant accident. After the retirement, I had an opportunity to serve as a senior fellow at the Harvard University. And during these, uh, those days, uh, I had an opportunity to interview with uh, many uh, senior government officials and also US uh, senior uh, military commanders. Uh, and the, oh, finally, I published a book uh, titled The Operation Tomodachi, its process and recommendations in Japanese. Uh, the following arguments uh, basically come from uh, this book. So as for the U.S.-Japan command and control issues, uh, let's begin uh, with the Prime Minister Kishida's quotation. He answered at the January's diet deliberations that, I quote, I am not considering sharing command authority between Japan and the U.S., nor uh, transferring to the U.S., unquote. This fundamental assumption tells us that the C2 issue does not mean to establish a single combined headquarters like U.S. ROC Combined Forces Command. Or rather, mostly lies in bilateral coordination mechanism. Practically, the two forces have cultivated the bilateral coordination process through countless bilateral exercises and dialogues for almost half a century. It is appropriate to clarify the flow of the coordination mechanism based on the defense guidelines. The bilateral coordination system rests on the top political leadership between the Japanese Prime Minister and the U.S. President, as well as 2 plus 2 at the Minister Secretary level. Based on this political leadership, uh, Security Subcommittee, SSC, and Subcommittee for Defense Cooperation SDC and Joint Committee, SJC, have been established. On March 11, 2011, uh, once in a thousand year level mega earthquake hit Japan, 
Tsunami waves swallowed everything, and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactors were severely damaged. During the response to the Fukushima Daiichi accident, both governments established a bilateral interagency coordination cell. Eleven days after the accident, the Japanese head was Mr. Goshi Hosono, a special advisor to the Prime Minister. The coordination meeting was held every evening. I had been attending this as representative of the JSDF. The meeting was highly praised by the U.S. participants because the information sharing was drastically improved and the Japanese response was orchestrated thanks to Mr. Hosono's political leadership. Later, the U.S. participants called the cell Hosono process. The lessons learned of the Operation Tomodachi had been incorporated into the 2015 defense guidelines. This guidelines newly established the Alliance Coordination Group, ACG. With this revision, not only the Cabinet Secretariat and the Ministries of Foreign and Defense, but also relevant ministries are expected to participate in the ACG as needed. The necessity of PJHQ Permanent Joint Headquarters was also strongly recognized by the self-defense forces after the Operation Tomodachi. The earthquake occurred just four years after the establishment of the Joint Staff Office, JSO. And JSO is a staff organization that assists Minister of Defense, also tacitly serves as a Joint Command Headquarters that bundles the three services' major commands. At the time of the disaster, the Joint Chief, General Oriki, spent most of his time advising the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense, also frequently discussing the bilateral issues with the U.S. Joint Chief, Admiral Mullen, Pacific Command Commander, Admiral Willard, and USFJ Commander, General Field. Thus, General Riki had limited time spent on major commands operations and communications with the major commanders. Reflecting these lessons, the JSDF gained a str strong recognition that the PJHQ should be established promptly. However, it took 11 years to set the establishment of the PJHQ in 2022 National Defense Strategy. So, recommendations. As, for, as the world witnessed, the global security landscape is becoming more fluid and fragile. Recognizing this situation, Japan and the U.S. forces are strengthening strategic dialogues and exercises. C2 relationship between Japan and the U.S. shall be further strengthened and integrated seamlessly from political policy level to operational level. The followings are my recommendations with my knowledge and expertise. Uh, political and policy levels. We are in an era of hybrid warfare as well as civil military fusion. Every national instrument shall be incorporated into an orchestrated manner. First, designate a Kante politician, Prime Minister's Office politician, uh, as head of the Alliance Coordination Mechanism, ACM, in advance. 2015 guidelines stipulates that if the ACM, consisting of only government officials and the JSDF service members, recognize the need for political instructions or decisions, ACM can ask political involvement as needed. This stipulation is not enough for the response in gray zone situation and hybrid warfare. Second recommendation. Uh, Policy level. Designate relevant ministries as standing members of ACG. In hybrid warfare or gray zone situation, the bilateral coordination between Japan and the U.S. is expected to cover a wide range of areas such as cyber security, radio frequency use, airport seaport use, critical infrastructure protection, and economic security. Therefore, participation of relevant ministries such as ministries of international affairs and communication, finance, health, labor, and welfare, economy, trade, and industry, and land infrastructure, transportation, and tourism shall be standing members of ACG from the initial stage. 
Next, uh, operational level recommendations. First, uh, clarify the division of roles between the J Joint Staff Office, JSO, and the PJHQ. The following explanation is my personal analysis. The status of PJHQ is the highest command that integrates the, jo uh, the three major commands to carry out joint operations and also is the operational counterpart of Indo-PECOM. The roles of PJHQ are to carry out JSDF's joint operations, bilateral operations with U.S. forces, if necessary with coalition forces, and civil protection operations. The roles in peacetime may be as follows. First, formulation of joint defense plans Second, formulation of bilateral operations plan with Indo-PACOM. Third, management of major commands force, planning and execution of joint bilateral multilateral exercises. Fifth, peacetime engagement with relevant organizations. And sixth, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, both domestic and overseas. In a gray zone situation, the following roles are expected. First, situation awareness of ongoing situations. Second, formulation of action plans in accordance with the situation. Third, bilateral multilateral operational coordination. Fourth, flexible deterrence options coordination with Indo PACOM. In the event of an armed attack, it would play the following roles. This is the phase in which bilateral coordination is most intense. One, same as gray zone scenarios. Second, all domain maximum bilateral coordination, especially intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Plus, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, uh, targeting. Uh, operational level recommendation number two is concrete in detail the C2 structure during the transition phase from peacetime or gray zone to armed attack situation. The most critical period in establishing C2 between Japan and the US is the transition phase from a gray zone situation to an armed attack situation. Presumably during this period, the center of gravity of bilateral C2 shifts from JSO versus indo pacom level to PJHQ versus US JTF Japan level coordination. US JTF Japan here is a US joint task force, which is presumably established in Japan for conducting bilateral operations with the JSDF. Third recommendation, embody information sharing and integrated targeting. In the event of an armed attack, the PJHQ and the USFJ, US JTF Japan would intens intensively and energetically coordinate the bilateral operations. In particular, as Japan possesses its counter-strike capabilities, the National Defense Strategy states that Japan and the US will work together to deal with ballistic missiles and other issues. Not only ISRs, but also targeting needs to be shared in real time between the two forces. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Sobe. That was, that was terrific. We have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, maybe I'll start here and then invite um, a, a, a question or two from the room. Um, and I'll sort of ask uh, at once a number of these. First of all, for Hikotani Sensei, you know, you described this gap uh, between, uh, you know, what the, what the national defense and national security strategies set out as Japan's both its security environment and its response to that security environment, but then sort of the, where the Japanese public is in terms of um, uh, support for action, support for cooperation with the United States alliance operations. How do we close that gap? Um, are there steps that uh, Japan should be taking, um, steps that we can take as an alliance? Uh, for, for Haino, um, you listed a number of things that uh, Japan, from your point of view, should have as priorities. I wonder if you could, and you said a little bit about this, what priorities would you say are for the United States uh, to take full advantage of, of the path that uh, Japan has embarked on? And then for generally Sobe and Mark together, uh, if I could, um, uh, 
General Sobe, you set out the kind of the parameters that the Prime Minister is already putting around um, what a future Alliance C2 structure could look like. The, lim in the and his testimony to the Diet, you cited very clearly. Um, I wonder, I'd be interested in both of your thoughts. What sort of joint operational structure does the United States need in Japan, uh, if any? Or is the existing structure sufficient um, uh, and adaptable from what PACOM can bring to bear uh, in the moment if it's needed? Um, maybe I'll, uh, Hikutani Sensei, maybe if you could start and then Um, yes, um, that's a really hard question. Um, and that, um, let me just say two things. I think it's important to, um, when it comes to the issue of burdens, that we delocalize the issue and make it a national security issue. That's much easier said than done. But there's something about the fact that the general public does not really see things because it tends to be in one area or the other. And we're going to have debates. But I think there's a, I think the positive of it is actually good news that I think people are feeling more secure if there are bases, for instance, in various places and all that. So I think we should try to see if there's a better way to pitch the argument. And, and the second thing is I think openness helps because I think generally speaking, what we heard here should be good news. But there's a tendency to think that, oh my gosh, the, the, the public might freak out if they hear this. But just become, between the time I was teaching at the Defense Academy from 1999, 2016, a lot has changed. But not many people know about it, especially in the area of U.S.-Japan. And I think people feel more confident if we hear more about it. So I think openness and so delocalization uh, will be key in making the argument that closing gap. Because I don't think that it's just that the public is opposed and we have to fill the gap. I think it's more that public is generally agree, uh, uh, um, agreeing upon uh, on what we're, the course we're on. It's just that they don't really know about it and that could lead to negative feelings about it. So with respect to uh, the defense industrial base, I think that, um, again, drawing from the lessons, the hard lessons, frankly, uh, out of the Ukraine uh, conflict, uh, the United States uh, government, uh, probably with uh, some congressional um, incentives, let's say, <laughs> needs to relook um, ITAR and all the other tech release issues. Um, we're basically, and let me actually also say, I'm not advocating for shortcuts with respect to security. Security obviously always needs to be a, a paramount um, consideration, but we do need to see how we can share uh, more effectively uh, with allies, including the Japanese, and I would say the Japanese need to be at the top of the list. Um, because the model that we have relied upon, the basically, you know, the just-in-time production of defense capabilities, um, Ukraine has demonstrated that's just not good enough. And I would say, uh, you know, if you look at the announcements that were made, I think, early last week, when President Biden and his Australian and UK counterparts uh, made, you know, the big AUKUS announcements in San Diego, frankly, that should serve as a way to break through some of these issues because if we can't share with uh, the Brits and the Aussies, we'll never be able to share with the Japanese and others. So that would be on the U.S. side at the top of my to-do list. Thank you. Uh, Mark or generally so bad? So on that, I'd say you know, I, I don't think that we're going to make um, U.S. Forces Japan the Joint Task Force Commander that was called out in the National Defense Authorization Act for, out of respect for Japan, which is to say that, you know, um, the most likely, one of the, you know, the likely missions of this could be in the South China Sea or it could be off of Taiwan or it could be in the East China Sea. If it was an East China Sea scenario, then probably the U.S. command and control being in Japan would be okay. For the other two, that might introduce political problems. So my thoughts are that we're going to develop a, this joint task force as something that can, it'll probably use an existing commander like the Pacific Fleet commander and be able to operate from, say, Guam in a Taiwan scenario, Philippines or Guam in a South China Sea scenario, or Japan or Guam in an East China Sea scenario as um, the U.S. and our allies see fit. So I think that's more likely. That does not mean 
that we should not be overhauling U.S. Forces Japan. U.S. Forces Japan is effectively a, um, a, a air component commander for Fifth Air Force and a protocol command. And it needs to be moved very, it needs to be much more towards a, a um, exercising command and, a, um, and an, a, 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 an operational subordinate command that can assist in the development, you know, that movement from, you know, where we're moving from coordinated to integrated and integrated to unified. I think it can play a role in that, but it will not be the long-term commander. I just, I don't think that's realistic or fair to our Japanese partners who need to make the decision whether or not a U.S. command and control uh, unit is, you know, is uh, deployed on Japanese uh, territory. All set. Thank General. you. Uh, the fact is that, uh, as uh, Admiral Montgomery uh, mentioned, that the USFJ is not a uh, joint operation capable headquarters. And uh, during the Operation Tomodachi, uh, initially, uh, USFJ uh, tried to establish a coordinated uh, uh, headquarters. Uh, so existing uh, US Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and a little bit Army uh, coordinated uh, among them. But uh, Admiral Willard, a PACOM commander, uh, then decided that two, about two weeks later, the, the tsunami uh, established the Joint Support Force Headquarters and sent uh, Pacific Fleet Commander Admiral Walsh to Yokota Air Base, then conducted the joint operations there as an Operation Tomodachi. So I think uh, there might be uh, maybe two, op two options, possible options. One is augmented uh, USFJ uh, to enable a joint capable or headquarters. Another is uh, like an, uh, send on a joint task force uh, headquarters from Hawaii or somewhere. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, lots more to discuss on this topic, but I think we'll now uh, transition to the next uh, panel. But please join me in a round of applause for our terrific group here. And we'll, we'll do a quick reposturing and, and get started with the second panel. Thanks.
right, thank you everybody. We'll roll right into our second panel. Uh, appreciate you sticking with us, uh, as well as our online audience. I'm Nick Say Cheney, Senior Fellow with the Japan Chair, and it's really my privilege to, to chair the second panel of our event, which is titled Advancing Networked Regional Security Architecture. And we're gonna do this in two contexts. Uh, the first is bilaterally with respect to space cooperation between the US and Japan. Uh, and then uh, secondly, how the US and Japan can network with other like-minded partners in the region. Uh, and let me briefly introduce uh, our panelists and then get right into the presentations. Uh, to my immediate right is, is Lisa Curtis of the Center for New American Security. Uh, to her right is uh, Mr. Hideshi Tokuchi, uh, president of um, <clears> the <throat> Research Institute for Peace and Security in Tokyo. Uh, at the end of the table is Sadia Pekkanen, professor from the University of Washington. And joining us virtually, bright and early, and for that we are most grateful, uh, is Kazuto Suzuki, professor of the University of Tokyo, um, and uh, also the director of a of new think tank in Japan, the, the Institute for for geoeconomics. Um, so we'll invite each of you to, to make some opening remarks and I might ask a few follow-ups and, uh, and then invite our audience to, to get involved. But let me start with you, uh, Professor Suzuki, um, on uh, your research questions with respect to uh, the role of space in Japan's new strategy um, and, and what the challenges and opportunities might be. So please, welcome. Suzuki, I think are you are you muted? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll come back to you. We'll uh, we'll we'll fix that issue. Uh, if you would mind pinch hitting. Uh, okay. Since it's World Baseball. Uh, okay. <laughs> competition week, <laughs> Professor. Pettis, okay. Well. Um, uh, thank you, first of all, to Chris and to Nicholas for having me along for this uh, event. It's a real pleasure to be here and to really reflect on the U.S.-Japan alliance, which has come a long way from the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, today, we are uh, concerned with the evolution of this alliance in new directions, such as in strategic domains like space, that are themselves evolving in unprecedented uh, ways. And uh, speaking to the themes of this uh, panel, what I want to do is to reflect on repositioning the U.S.-Japan alliance, particularly in the unfolding realities of the space domain in its geopolitical uh, context. And I want to just do uh, three uh, questions. First, uh, you know, what is the context that raises the importance of thinking about the U.S.-Japan alliance in space? Second. Um, what specific capabilities might be important for the alliance, uh, given the uh, technological trajectories that we see today in the space domain altogether? And third, what are the competences that in both the U.S. and Japan that will allow the two countries to effect and sustain a momentum of collaboration that draws in other partners and actors at a time when the world order has really changed. So if you'll permit me, um, I should also add that the basis for my remarks today uh, come from uh, a work that I just completed co-editing. This, this will be out later in 2023. Uh, this is the Oxford Handbook of Space Security and has 50 plus IR uh, strategic studies analysts spread around uh, the world. And just to give you a sense of what this project has uh, sort of taught me, it's given me a very keen awareness of the promise of the space domain, but also the peril of what we're seeing in the space domain and what it will take to sort of bring others on board uh, to make space safe and secure for all stakeholders. Uh, this is especially important because 95% of space technologies are dual use, meaning that they go across civilian and military purposes and across socioeconomic and national security uh, issues. And I fully believe that augmenting capabilities, uh, the theme of this uh, event, is important for securing uh, space. But I equally and fully believe that space diplomacy is what is necessary uh, to bring it about and to really sustain it going uh, forward. And I think that echoes some of the things that we heard in the first panel uh, as well. With that first, uh, let me begin with the uh, context. And uh, I said this earlier, but as a context, I should say, 
uh, that some of the trends that we're seeing in the space domain today are really very, very promising. Uh, it is marked by a rising number of uh, players spread around the world, and it's marked by unprecedented commercial technologies, such as uh, the SpaceX uh, reusable rockets uh, from uh, in the US, but also iSpace in Japan, whose lander is, even at this very moment, orbiting uh, the moon. Uh, so this is very exciting uh, to see. But this is also a domain there, where there are perils. Um, and one of these perils is, of course, the slide towards weaponization that we see in space. The United States has marked geopolitics with a return to great power competition and also marked space as a warfighting domain. The US is no longer the uncontested unipolar power in space. China has made impressive strides and achievements. And these are the two countries leading space stations in orbit today. All this is to say is that in the international order, we're dealing with a domain that is marked by the bipolarity of alliances, one led by the United States and the other by China. On the one side, there is the United States with allies like Japan and newfound Quad friends attempting to coordinate like-mindedness in cross-domain operations involving space. On the other side is China, with a newly minted lunar pact with Russia, its all-weather friend Pakistan, and the newly demonstrated influence in the Middle East, which is anchoring its space information corridor in the customer base within its Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. So in this bipolarity of alliances, who is allied with whom matters to identifying threats and challenges, to building alliance augmenting capabilities to deal with them and to effecting the diplomacy in which these capabilities are housed uh, both especially at a regional uh, level. These things are going to be very critical elements in ensuring space security. So second, given this context, what are some realistic ways to augment capabilities for the US and Japan in, through, and at the nexus of space? Um, just very briefly, I want to begin by saying that we need to appreciate that space assets, primarily satellites, form a critical digital infrastructure for all spacefaring powers, whether they're established or whether they're new. They invisibly empower economic, environmental, and social realities, as well as military defense intertwined with cyber and nuclear security. Importantly, for the US and its allies, such as Japan, we see an increasing alignment of understanding about the nature of threats in, through, and at the nexus of the space domain. Whether these threats are accidental or deliberate does not any longer change this shared understanding about the hazards to civilian, commercial, and military space operations. Now, from my point of view, here are some realistic priority areas sort of stretched from the more immediate to the long term that the two allies can collaborate on. One immediate priority area in space involves building an integrated space domain awareness architecture that enables foundational safety for all space operations carried out by any and all stakeholders across the world and in any region. This is a public good that needs to be built, and this will require allied leadership. Aside from illuminating what is where at what coordinates at any point in time, this sort of a space map, this architecture can layer in allied spacecraft for rendezvous proximity operations, or RPOs, in which space objects are brought together purposefully. RPO-enabled spacecraft can be designed to serve civilian, commercial, and defense interests threatened by orbital debris more immediately. But in the long term, they can also be repurposed to safeguard operations from LEO to geosynchronous orbits and onto cislunar space and celestial bodies. So that is one priority area. Another priority area through space involves configuring constellations of small satellites, big data, to more effectively support national and allied decision making, both in peacetime and wartime, about how, when, and where to act, again, both in the region and also the world. This emerging frontier has already changed prospects for civilian observation of virtually all human activities on a global and persistent basis, meaning not just national security, but also economic, social, climate, and other pressures that threaten countries and the international order. 
If anyone wants to take a look, I have a co-authored article in the journal International Security with Setsuko Aoki, who is Japan's leading space lawyer, and John Mittelman, who is at the US Naval uh, Research Lab on small satellites, big data architectures that spell out these realities for contemporary global and especially maritime security about which we heard in the first panel. Ukraine is in some ways the test case for what we wrote about. A final priority area, looking a little bit uh, further out, uh, involves even at this very early stage to really preemptively having uh, technical and policy dialogues on the nexus of space technologies and systems with others such as cybersecurity, autonomous robotics, quantum encryption and information networks, and the expanding fusion of AI with satellite data. These are critical civil, commercial, military intersections whose fusion will have an impact across all human activities and across all domains, continents, regions, and countries. And importantly, again, this will affect uh, all decision-making stretched across both peacetime and wartime. Finally, uh, to end, what are the competences, the pieces in play in both the US and Japan that can allow the two countries to achieve a momentum of collaboration? I firmly believe this is not just a one-shot thing, but a momentum must be built uh, for this collaboration. Uh, a momentum that serves as a magnet to draw others in at a time when the world order has changed, when peaceful prospects in space are threatened, and that also affect the future great power a standing of the United States. Let me end by saying that in this bipolar contest for the US, augmenting cutting-edge space-centric capabilities with allies like Japan is of vital interest as I have described. But let me also sound a cautionary note. Focusing on enhancing technological capabilities alone is not enough. And I think this again echoes what we were hearing uh, in the earlier panel. To give meaningful effect to capabilities, we also have to preemptively clarify what can and will be done jointly by law and policy frameworks in, through, and at the nexus of space. We need greater clarification on the principal frameworks by which allies will come to aid each other to ensure space security, that is to ensure freedom of navigation, to ensure operations without disruption. Unfortunately, from international law perspectives on space security, our frameworks and alliances are sort of stuck in terrestrial mode. So for the US and Japan, this is an opportunity to build credible clarifications in the context of their alliance as it has been extended uh, to space. That is not just identify what the red lines in space are, but to preemptively communicate what all can expect from the two allies, friends and foe alike, when these red lines are crossed. This, I think, is the diplomatic work ahead for the two allies, giving content to protections and reverse protections of space assets that meaningfully operationalize an equal alliance extended to space. In my view, who knows what and when and is aware of capability uh, create enabled consequences is critical for shaping behavior for safe and secure operations involving the space domain. Building platforms for this kind of preemptive communication, signaling, and messaging is also the work ahead for the US and Japan, and that work needs to be firmly tethered to the principles of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. For that, the two countries need to think about ways to align their science, economic, and military space diplomacy at both the global and the regional level. Building on what Japan has already set in motion, and has been doing this for decades, through its regional Asia-Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, this diplomacy will help to equalize alliance responsibilities in space, and it is foundational for defense priorities in both the US and Japan. And these allied diplomatic communications over time are also, I want to end by saying, an inclusive and a ground up way to build a shared understanding among all established and emerging spacefaring countries about norms and behavior that will affect peaceful prospects in outer space. Thank you so much. I will leave you with that. Thank you. That was excellent. You identified uh, the promise, some of the challenges, um, and at the end there, the, the normative dimensions to U.S.-Japan cooperation in, in the realm of space, which is, which is really critical. Um, should we try Professor Suzuki again? Hopefully we won't get a second strike. <laughs> Please. Sure. Um, I, I think we still have a one more strike to go, but nevertheless, um, uh, can you hear me? 
Yeah, please go ahead. Can you hear me you. okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, the uh, my my computer hasn't really uh, woke up at uh, uh, five o'clock in the morning. Um, <clears throat> But um, anyway, uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very um, wonderful uh, discussion about the, the future of the um, Alliance uh, through the new technologies. And I think space is uh, being a very important one. And I think uh, Sadia has uh, nicely set up that uh, the, the need for the further um, alliance and the cooperation between Japan and the United States for uh, establishing the more uh, uh, fine and skill uh, relationship in space. Let me just uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what is written and uh, discussed in the uh, latest national security strategy uh, and uh, and how space is uh, is placed in the, in the entire strategy. So. Um, the Japan, uh, in the historical context, the Japan has not been involved in space for many, many years because of the uh, constitutions and the understanding of the constitution. And the first time that uh, space appeared in in uh, in the defense document was 2013, and then um, it is evolved in 2018 and the national defense, <coughs> excuse me, um, national defense program guidelines. But the, this is the first time in a serious sense that the Japan has uh, declared that it is going to invest in space and further develop the uh, cooperation with the United States and, uh, and the friends alike. So, so what are the, uh, the points that are made in the, in the national security uh, uh, strategy document? There are three pillars. One of uh, one is the uh, ensuring the security from space, which means that uh, strengthening the space utilization by the self defense forces and Japan Coast Guard, and also uh, in the second pillar was the ensuring the security in space, which means the responding to the threat to stabilize the uh, utilization of the outer space which is more uh, for the international uh, public use of space. And the third was supporting and fostering the space industry. So with regard to this uh, security from space, this is a very import, uh, interesting development of, um, of using space for the defense purposes. The first, Japan, the Japanese self-defense force has not had the reconnaissance or uh, surveillance satellite, but this is uh, the first time that the reconnaissance satellite were uh, uh, clearly uh, 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 cl clearly mentioned in the, de the defense document for the targeting of the counter strike capabilities. So the targeting issue, which has discussed in the previous uh, the, uh, previous panel. Is, is an extremely important and the space will play a huge role in uh, defining the, uh, the ca Japanese capabilities of the, uh, of the targeting. Then the second point was to, um, to identify and, and find and track the uh, hypersonic gliding vehicle. The hypersonic gliding vehicle missile defense is quite different from the ballistic missile um, uh, ballistic missile missile defense because the missile defense uh, requires the constant monitoring of the of the movement of the uh, hypersonic gliding vehicle which are traveling through the atmosphere and which doesn't have the fixed courses so that we need to have a real time uh, tracking and tracing capabilities for uh, for identifying the directions and the uh, and the altitude of the uh, high, um, the, the missile. Of course, uh, it requires the thousands of satellites, so it uh, is uh, extremely difficult to do it by uh, Japan alone, and also it is uh, quite difficult for the U.S. alone to do this. So uh, I think this is where the Japan and U.S. alliance will play a huge role to set up the uh, multinational, multi-satellite uh, 
uh, uh, monitoring and cap uh, monitoring and tracking capabilities. So this um, uh, hypersonic gliding vehicle issue is going to be the major uh, discussion, uh, which was the um, which was take place uh, yesterday and today in Japan for the comprehensive uh, space dialogue uh, with the uh, industry and the government officials in J in Tokyo, and uh, this um, comprehensive dialogue is uh, is now shifting the real focus on the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the building up the uh, common uh, common uh, infrastructure for space uh, in order to uh, to build up these uh, 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 meeting with the challenges of the uh, uh, missile uh, missile defense uh, from uh, china north korea and and russia so this um, area is the, is going to be the uh, central um, uh, issue, but also um, the, the other pillar, the security in space, is going to be another uh, pillar for another important issue for the um, uh, for the alliance to uh, to work together. The in order to secure the activities in space, we need to have the uh, capabilities. Of monitoring and uh, <clears throat> only monitoring and and understanding the situation uh, to improve the situational awareness, so that the space domain awareness uh, satellites are required to have uh, to to uh, to to have the capabilities to monitor the um, development of the um, of the uh, the. Uh, uh, hostile activities in space and make sure that the will be able to trace and track of the um, other countries satellites activities in uh, in in space so the space domain awareness is the one of the key issue to secure the uh, information but at the same time this space domain uh, space domain awareness is also a very um, uh, it requires a lot of satellites, and to make sure that we do have the ground-based radars and uh, uh, and the telescopes for monitoring the movement of the space objects. So the space domain awareness is going to be another uh, a major focus on the alliance uh, activities, and we already have the. Uh, uh, we are already under development of the uh, uh, radar system uh, by the Ministry of Defense uh, in the Yamaguchi Prefecture to build up the uh, space domain awareness capabilities. And uh, this is uh, the major role of the self-defense force, the air self-defense force, which will be turned into the air and space uh, self-defense force in the future. Um, the, the, and the space activities for the mainly about uh, uh, currently, the self defense force is working for the for improving the monitoring capabilities of the uh, of the space domain awareness. And in fact, the um, uh, uh, space components of the uh, air self defense force is now working closely together with the United States for um, for building up the uh, monitoring capabilities the other point of securing the um, uh, space activities is to set up the international rules the currently there is an ongoing discussion at the geneva the uh, conference on disarmament uh, namely the uh, paros the uh, uh, prevention of the arms race in space um, this paros uh, meeting there is a, a, a UK-led uh, discussion uh, on the responsible behavior in space. So United States and Japan both uh, declaring the uh, ban on the ASAT, the anti-satellite test for destroying the satellite by missiles. And this uh, declaration was followed by the nine different countries, but Japan was the first uh, after the United States to declare the ban on the ASAT test, and this was the uh, a movement to to build up the international uh, norms 
for preventing the creation of the space debris, which will be harmful for the uh, space assets. So these activities for building up the international rules are also the center of the Japan-United States uh, alliance uh, for, uh, for setting up the uh, international rules that has described by Saudi a minute ago. So finally, um, <clears throat> the future of the space security is, uh, is going to be a very um, widely uh, new to the uh, Japanese uh, uh, security strategy. And uh, uh, currently, uh, Jap- uh, the National Space Policy Committee of Japan, which I am a member of, uh, is trying to build up the initiative for the space security strategy. And this initiative is going to break down the um, what is uh, written in the national, uh, national security strategy and to turn into the uh, a con- uh, congressionally budgetary request for the uh, uh, f- uh, five-year uh, basic space plan. So this um, basic space plan is going to have is is going to be the major um, uh, budgetary uh, uh, and a legal source for the further investment in space. And I think this is uh, going to be the um, a new uh, new uh, 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 opportunity for Japan to uh, to uh, set up the clear definition and the clear direction of which. Uh, uh, which systems uh, needs to go uh, in priority and uh, how much is going to spend on space. And the space uh, in the in the document of the uh, defense build-up plan um, is going to increase the uh, uh, 1 trillion yen in five years. So this is uh, going to be a, a huge investment compared to the previous uh, uh, Japanese space investment in defense. So... Um, this uh, will allow uh, self-defense force to work together with the allies. And I think this is uh, uh, going to uh, open up the further collaboration uh, of the alliance in the future. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. That was an excellent overview. And I'll come back to, to each of you with a, with a few questions in a minute. Uh, let's transition now quickly to the regional dimension. And uh, Tokuchi san, please. Thank you. Well, um, let, uh, first, uh, you know, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick. And uh, let me thank uh, the CSIS, particularly uh, Nick and uh, Chris, for having me uh, uh, in this uh, great uh, you know, event. Uh, it's always fun, very, uh, good, uh, great fun to work with CSIS. Thank you very much. Um, actually, you know, as time is very much limited, I'd like to talk about two things. Uh, uh, first, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. And secondly, in re- relation to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Japan-US alliance. And, um, you know, first of all, uh, uh, talking about the new national security strategy of Japan, um, you know, there are, of course, uh, some unprecedented and ambitious uh, things uh, in it. And uh, it is very much, very much unusual for the Japanese government uh, to uh, call it a dramatic transformation when it changes its course in the national security policy. But in fact, it is not revolution. It's uh, you know, uh, evolution, I think. The course of Japan's policy remains almost the same. But uh, the Japanese efforts uh, have become accelerated in light of the aggravation of the situation. And the uh, most important thing is that the three pillars of the Japanese national security and defense policy, uh, namely uh, you know, Japan's own efforts, Japan-US alliance, and uh, regional and extra-regional uh, security cooperation, these three pillars uh, almost remain the same. And, uh, the, uh, and also the uh, alliance relationship between the two countries, I mean, the Japan and the United States, uh, is uh, the core of uh, the uh, Japanese uh, security policy. Uh, however, uh, it is not easy to understand the entire picture 
of uh, the uh, three uh, national security documents newly published by the Japan uh, Japanese government because uh, the national security strategy lacks uh, Japan's regional strategy. Uh, instead, a national defense strategy has uh, some of it. Uh, having said so, uh, the, uh, I mean, one of the most in interesting passages uh, in the national security strategy, uh, to me, is as follows. Uh, I quote, as a nation in the Indo-Pacific region, Japan will further promote efforts to realize a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, by deepening cooperation with like-minded countries uh, through the Japan-US alliance as a cornerstone and uh, through efforts such as the Japan-US-Australia-India partnership. To this end, Japan will strive to make the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific more universal and the, uh, around the world and expand uh, efforts to ensure maritime security." Unquote. Uh, therefore, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific concept has become the key concept uh, to promote uh, the Japan-US alliance cooperation and uh, the security partnership with other like-minded countries. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, launched uh, Japan's new plan for a, a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, in his speech uh, three days ago in India. Uh, although the uh, Japanese uh, free and open Indo-Pacific vision is not clearly defined in the national security strategy or the national defense strategy, uh, the Kishida speech will, will um, uh, somewhat supplement the definition. Of course, the uh, format is the same as before. You know, uh, prime minister's speech and some you know PowerPoint slides. Uh, the, therefore, the format is. Uh, almost the same, but uh, the ends, means, and uh, uh, ways uh, to achieve free and open Indo-Pacific is um, clearer than in the past presentation by the Japanese government. Uh, its geographical uh, priorities are clearer, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and also Pacific Island uh, region. Uh, the Japanese military contribution to uh, uh, FOIP, I mean the contribution of the Japanese defense forces to the vision for free and open Indo-Pacific is clearer than before. Uh, it provides a formal basis for, I mean the Kishida uh, speech uh, provides a formal uh, basis for aligning with a variety of partners which already uh, launched uh, their own Indo-Pacific strategies, uh, such as uh, the United States, Australia, uh, South Korea, Canada, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Uh, security cooperation is uh, expanded to air domain as well. Uh, careful scrutiny is uh, necessary about uh, his speech, but uh, if it is not just a patchwork of uh, existing uh, miscellaneous projects, it can be uh, regarded as another transformation of the Japanese security policy. Uh, the Indo-Pacific region has a number of smaller uh, security uh, frameworks, and the uh, US-centered alliance network is the most important instrument uh, among them, but the regional security uh, can be achieved only when the uh, alliance network is well networked with uh, other partners and regional uh, networks. Uh, it is important for the Japanese government to present a blueprint for crafting such a larger uh, framework. The new strategy documents uh, of last year and the new uh, you know, plan for free and open Indo-Pacific uh, lack uh, this design, so it should be fixed uh, as a next step. And uh, and secondly, I'd like to touch upon a little bit about the uh, Japan-US alliance relationship in this regard. And actually, the uh, uh, if you see uh, the new national security strategy of Japan, the dividing line between the alliance cooperation between the two countries and also um, you know, international security cooperation with uh, other uh, regional or extra-regional partners this dividing line is more blurred than uh, the previous uh, strategy documents. This is very interesting. And uh, the, uh, that's why I'm referring to this uh, uh, in panel two. 
uh, the Japan US Alliance and the uh, US Center, the Alliance Network in the uh, Asia Pacific are, the, uh, are not one way flow of aid or uh, projects. Uh, uh, they are, uh, you know, mutual cooperation actually. And uh, US uh, allies, uh, of course, including Japan, should uh, work more closely together uh, to sustain the international order by, uh, you know, enhancing their roles and the missions if the U.S. Uh, has uh, some difficulty in the uh, management of international risks as written in the National Security Strategy of Japan. Uh, our uh, common ends uh, 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 should uh, be presented as a new set of common strategic objectives and our ways uh, should be cl clarified as a, a new framework division of labor between the two countries. Uh, the present set of common strategic objectives was uh, established uh, as the joint statement of the two plus two ministerial uh, uh, in 2005. Uh, Actually, uh, you know, in uh, panel one, uh, Mr. Klinik uh, talked about uh, a little bit about the DPRI or uh, U.S. force posture realignment. And the, um, the basis of uh, the DPRI or the uh, for U.S. force posture realignment in Japan was the, uh, you know, common strategic objectives of 2005. The world today is completely different from those days. So the uh, objectives should be renewed immediately, uh, 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 also as uh, the basis of the change of the U.S. force posture uh, in Japan or in that region. Uh, division of labor uh, between the two countries defined by the uh, uh, you know, guidelines for Japan-U.S. Uh, defense cooperation of 2015 and the two countries uh, should review the guidelines for uh, uh, this one uh, uh, in order to define a new set of uh, roles and missions and to develop joint capabilities. Uh, this review, however, should have a much wider scope as follows. Two points. First, uh, the scope of the present guidelines uh, is uh, not fully whole of government, uh, somewhat mentioned by uh, General Isobe in uh, panel one. Truly, a whole of government approach uh, should be uh, crafted. It shouldn't be the, just the guidelines for defense cooperation. Uh, of particular in, uh, uh, importance is, of course, to ensure uh, the commitment of the maritime law inf uh, enforcement organizations. Um, uh, now that uh, the uh, Japan uh, national security strategies uh, strategy uh, gives uh, Japan Coast Guard important roles to achieve the national security. Uh, Japan Coast Guard important roles to achieve the national security. The Coast Guards of both countries uh, should be fully incorporated in such a new uh, framework of uh, security cooperation. And of course, it is quite relevant to uh, the uh, you know uh, gray zone uh, warfare which uh, China engineers uh, to us. Uh, secondly, the scope of uh, Japan's uh, uh, Japan US guidelines should be expanded to include cooperation with regional and extra regional partners. Japan US alliance is part, uh, as I said, you know, the Japan US alliance is uh, an integral part of the US centered alliance network in the Asia Pacific region. The alliance network must be more intertwined. Uh, for uh, the regional peace and stability and p a partnership uh, between Japan and other regional allies of the United States, like you know, Australia, South Korea, the Philippines, and much more, uh, must be strengthened, of course, in to, you know, including Taiwan, uh, to make the alliance network more robust, and the Japanese guidelines will have to have more multi lateral partnership elements uh, in it. And actually, uh, if possible, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, you know, Japan's, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, security uh, partnership with other countries. But uh, as time is limited, I, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tokuji-san. Um, those partnerships relate to my question for you, so we'll definitely get back to that. Last but not least, Lisa Curtis, thank you for joining us, please. 
Well, thank you so much, Nick, Chris, and CSIS for inviting me to be part of this uh, very important and interesting project. Uh, so Chris asked me to explore what Japan's role could look like in creating a networked regional security architecture. Um, however, what I found in my research is that Japan already is helping to create that foundation for a regional security framework that will build a bulwark of deterrence in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so the U.S. will continue to lead uh, this effort, but I think there also is an increased recognition um, about the importance of other countries strengthening their relationships with each other. Um, and I will talk about that uh, in, in my remarks. Um, but the point is, uh, it's no longer the hub and spoke framework. Um, it's becoming uh, a lattice work of relationships that are all driving toward one vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, so certainly in, with its new security policies, um, Japan is clear about the need to quote unquote prevent the emergence of a situation in which any one state can unilaterally change the status quo. Um, we certainly uh, saw the concern when uh, five ballistic missiles landed in Japan's EEZ last August during China's military exercises in the Taiwan Strait, and uh, this really brought home to Japan that uh, China's intensifying military coercion of Taiwan uh, is directly impacting Japan's own security. Um, also, uh, as I think was stated in the other panel, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, has fur further raised alarm bells about similar aggression happening in the Indo-Pacific region, and that's what's motivating Japan to um, take a more proactive, I would say proactive, uh, maybe Tokuchi-san would say um, more clear, um, policy, defense policy, and more clear approach to working um, more intimately with other nations to uh, deter aggression. Um, and certainly with an eye toward increased Russia-China cooperation and joint activities uh, that are impacting Japan's security. So Tokyo is already committing to increasing security cooperation uh, with four uh, main nations that I will talk about, Australia, India, South Korea, and the Philippines, and all for the purposes of increasing deterrence. Um, so Japan's uh, interactions with these four nations um, demonstrates its determination to build a multinational security network. And uh, frankly, the flurry of meetings and agreements that we've seen over the last year with these nations um, is, is quite astonishing. And I think it's a testament to Japan's um, increasing concern over the deteriorating global security environment. So let's uh, just quickly go through um, what we've seen, this flurry of activity that we've seen um, with Japan's relationships. First, Australia. Um, we saw the two plus two talks uh, held uh, between the Australian and Japanese defense and foreign ministers in early December. They agreed to step up military cooperation, enhance interoperability of their forces, including exploring bilateral submarine search and rescue training, expanding air-to-air -air refueling operations. Um, so these are just a, a few of the um, steps that we are seeing between Australia and Japan, not to mention the um, deploying of Japanese F-35 fighters to Australia on a rotational basis. Um, so, you know, the, these um, are all important steps that we see. They follow the um, reciprocal access agreement, marking the first time that Japan has made such an agreement with another nation aside from the United States. Um, and, you know, if this is ratified by ja the Japanese parliament as expected, um, I think it'll be quite a, a, a milestone in Japan's relationships with other 
security relationships with other nations. Um, India, um, Toguchi san talked about the recent uh, Kishida visit, um, but Japan and India also have held two plus two talks um, in September. Uh, where they uh, announced a new joint fighter aircraft exercise. They agreed to enhance uh, multi-nation maritime cooperation in the Indian Ocean region. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to remember that it was actually Japan, it was former uh, uh, late Shinzo Abe, who was uh, the first Japanese leader to really think um, carefully about India and India's role in Indo-Pacific security. And really it was uh, Shinzo Abe uh, who had the, uh, initiated the concept for the quadrilateral security dialogue, the idea that India would join uh, Japan, Australia, US um, security talks. Now while the quad obviously has, has taken off in the last few years, um, it's mainly focused on economics, technology, public health, um, and the Quad members really downplay the idea of defense cooperation. However, uh, we have seen the Quad take a major maritime security cooperation uh, agreement uh, last May in Tokyo. Um, moreover, the four nations now uh, are uh, participating annually in the Malabar Naval Exercise. Uh, India had avoided inviting Australia to that uh, naval exercise for many years to avoid anti antagonizing Beijing. But it, it was um, the 2020 India-China border crisis which changed that. And now, you know, we can expect to see regular quad um, maritime naval exercises, even though they don't refer to them as quad exercises. Um, that's, in fact, what they are. Um, the Philippines, um, of course, uh, Philippine President uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. visited Japan in February. They agreed to enhance defense ties, um, including Japanese troop participation in HADR, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief training exercises, um, expanding the transfer of Japanese defense equipment and technology to the Philippines, um, and of course, strengthening that trilateral cooperation between the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines. Um, and, you know, lastly, let me um, talk about uh, South Korea, because uh, there has been um, uh, improvement in the uh, relationship between South Korea and Japan under the new South Korean government, not so new, uh, a year old now, but uh, I think this is uh, quite extraordinary, the, the fact that uh, the three countries, South Korea, Japan, the United States, staged the trilateral anti-submarine exercises uh, in September of last year following the North Korean uh, missile test um, in what Washington described as exercises that would quote unquote improve tactical and technical cooperation among the three navies. Um, and of course, last month, South Korea joined the U.S. and Japan in missile defense exercises. Um, so, you know, we definitely see deepening progress on trilateral defense cooperation between these three nations. Of course, you know, we can expect to see obstacles down the road from their historical disputes, um, but it, we have definitely seen an improvement from um, President Yoon suk yeol and his uh, overtures uh, to Japan. And I think, you know, for now, uh, we can expect to see um, increased cooperation. Um, and I think that, you know, really this focuses mainly on the uh, WMD threats from North Korea. But I think we should take this opportunity to leverage this trilateral cooperation to think about ways to also address Chinese gray zone activities. Um, as well as preparing for other military contingencies. Um, so the question is, how, how do we coordinate the efforts of these six nations um, to achieve a kind of integrated and networked deterrence? 
Um, I just talked about all the forward movement that we've seen in Japan's bilateral defense relationships in the region, but how do we combine or coordinate all of these activities and agreements to achieve a coherent strategy? And I think the, the real challenge is finding a balance between uh, creating a formal arrangement like an Asian NATO, which is not appropriate, um, but at the same time uh, making these multilateral activities into a credible deterrent. Um, and I think there needs to be a vision guiding these activities. Um, and I would just put out some of the following recommendations that I would um, see as, as important in trying to move forward in, in having a more coherent networked uh, deterrence. Uh, so the first thing is ensuring that statements um, that are addressing Indo-Pacific security issues of the six different nations um, increasingly uh, mirror one another. And that includes joint statements. Um, it, uh, you know, when, when two countries are uh, issuing a joint statement or, where the, or if it's a trilateral statement or even a quad, quadrilateral statement, um, they should always be trying to um, mirror what's being said in other statements throughout the region so that there's kind of a, an organic um, uh, messaging, a clear message that's, that's coming from all of these nations. Um, second, uh, the Six Nations should demonstrate in a very tangible way that they are working together. Now, this is very difficult, um, and it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and I agree with um, Heino Klink that we need to prioritize these efforts, um, and we probably need to start with the low-hanging fruit. Um, so one area that I would see as ripe for immediate focus among the Six Nations is coordinating an approach to maritime security. Um, and you know, certainly as a maritime nation, Japan is dependent on free and open seaways to ensure trade routes are accessible and unimpeded by aggressive maritime activities. Um, and this is something that Japan is committed to. It's in both the NDS, the NSS, um, and I think, you know, one idea that we can start with is inviting South Korea and the Philippines to be an integral part of the Quad Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that would be a good place to start. Um, of course, another aspect of building maritime security is closer Coast Guard cooperation among the Six Nations. This is something that, um, can be taken up looking at addressing illegal fishing, environmental issues, search and rescue, HADR. Um, again, this is some of the, the low-hanging fruit that I think we can start looking at um, uh, as, as the Six Nations start moving uh, in closer coordination. Um, the, uh, the other recommendation would be holding uh, tabletop exercises. Now, these would have to start with um, HADR contingencies, but perhaps in the future, you eventually address military contingencies um, that, that may, may arise. Uh, again, it needs to be a step-by-step -step process, um, and uh, it needs to... Um, not get ahead of what is sustainable over the long term. Um, and so in conclusion, um, again, you know, we need to balance this idea that it's, it's, it's urgent for uh, the countries of the Indo-Pacific to come up with this integrated deterrence or this networked security architecture, but it also needs to be sustainable. Um, and, you know, this is about deterrence. Um, you know, this is not about uh, Japan becoming more aggressive with its uh, security policies, um, as was discussed in the other panel. Um, this is about preventing countries from being able to change the territorial or maritime status quo through force um, and, and preventing conflict, maintaining peace. Um, so let me stop there, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. Um, terrific uh, summary of the potential for minilateralism in the, the region, uh, along with some very practical uh, recommendations to facilitate cooperation. Uh, we're up against the hour, but uh, it is my job to ask a few follow-up questions. So I'll follow Chris's lead from the first panel and ask one of each of our, of our panelists, um, and we'll, we'll do a lightning round. Uh, Suzuki-san, for you, I want to pick up on the last point you made uh, about efforts to, to set priorities uh, and, and the budget for Japan's new investment, investments in space. Um, you know, as, as you noted, there are many um, priorities listed in the national security strategy, and there are others, such as cyber, which are getting a lot of attention. Um, do you, in your view, is, is space more of a long-term uh, priority or objective? Um, are there resources that you think uh, require immediate attention? Or do you envision uh, a sort of, uh, of, of putting a framework in place first uh, that enables Japan to, to develop these advanced capabilities uh, incrementally. Uh, for Sadia, um, I was struck by the fact that the recent uh, U.S.-Japan 2 plus 2 statement talked about how Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty applies in space. Could you talk a little bit more about that and, and what kind of homework you think the U.S. and Japan have in terms of thinking about what that means um, operationally? Uh, Tokuchi-san, I'll let you pick any regional partner you want <laughs> uh, uh, and, and talk about what you think in the near term uh, the priorities for uh, Japan's cooperation with, with other regional partners should be. Uh, and finally, uh, for you, Lisa, um, you also flagged the importance of Japan working with other partners in the region. Uh, but I want to ask about AUKUS uh, and the potential for countries like Japan, if not to become formal members, um, the potential to tap in uh, to other networks like that in terms of uh, technology cooperation and, and developing habits of cooperation in the region. So Suzuki-san, we'll start with you and we'll, we'll zip around. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Just a lightning round. I'll um, I'll make the uh, comment on the the budgetary priority. The cyber, if you compare the cyber and space, cyber is more um, more high priority. The um, national security strategy uh, defines that we need to have a f about four thousand strong uh, cyber command in uh, self defense force, uh, which will also extend to the um, uh, uh, reform of the uh, national um, incident uh, uh, command uh, uh, center. So this will be a, a very important uh, element, and uh, this will be the priority. But nevertheless, I think space is a constant investment. Co uh, space is a long-term incremental activities. And I think, you know, space takes more time than the cyber. So I think uh, we are not rushing out for spending uh, so much money for space, but I think it will be a, a incremental um, activities. Uh, it's, th there'll be a constant and a continuous uh, investment in space. Thank you very much. Very, very helpful context. Sadia, please. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that uh, question. I said uh, at the beginning that we are dealing with um, alliance frameworks uh, that are not easily extended to space in the context of international space law today and also with respect to the treaty text of um, Article 5. If I understand the treaty text, it's uh, very clear it's supposed to be territories under the administration of uh, Japan, and we really can't extend territorial uh, principles um, out into space. So uh, I think that however we think about extending protections uh, to space is something that you need to sit behind and think through not just in a legal context, but also from an operational context. I was very struck by the first panel when, this, uh, when we talked about integrating, coordinating, um, and then uh, moving forward together. What happens when a satellite is attacked? Uh, yes, uh, can you attribute properly? Uh, what is the equal responsibility of both um, allies? Uh, you know, what does the treaty text says? How does it need to be interpreted? 
and where we go operationally, I think that's the work ahead diplomatically for both uh, countries to focus on. We're at the very early stages of sort of beginning to think uh, about this. I will say one thing, it is a priority for the U.S. in some ways because the U.S. is the most space-dependent country in the world. 60% of the operational space assets today belong to the United States. And I think, and Kazuto, you can, of course, uh, correct me, I think the US, uh, Japan is about 4 or 5% according to the present estimates of uh, the total operational space assets. So there's a different level of um, awareness about this, uh, this critical infrastructure that really does empower uh, U.S. military power um, on the ground. So um, for the U.S., we need to kind of get into the game quickly for Japan, I think because of the implications for uh, nuclear, uh, extended nuclear deterrence, it is also very important that we begin that conversation now. Yeah. All right, uh, I'll touch upon uh, two things, uh, Australia and Taiwan. Um, you know, uh, first time uh, Australia. Uh, last fall, uh, Japan and Australia uh, revised uh, the uh, 15 years old uh, joint declaration on uh, security cooperation, JDSC. And uh, actually, it's a very interesting document. Uh, according to that document, you know, over the next 10 years, Japan and Australia will work together more closely for our shared objectives. And uh, the following uh, sentence is very important. We will, I mean, Australia and Japan will consult each other on contingencies that may affect our uh, sovereignty and regional uh, security uh, interests, and consider measures in response. So consult and consider, uh, that's Im uh, important. But the next one is more important, uh, what, uh, how and what to act uh, based on the you know, consultation and consideration. So, um, you know, the, if uh, both, uh, you know, uh, both countries uh, act accordingly, then this uh, relationship is quite closer to alliance. And uh, also, uh, the two countries' security cooperation for the peace and stability of the Pacific Island nations uh, is also important uh, because uh, the Pacific Island region is a, a, very, a vital sea lane between Australia and Japan and also the, uh, located in the, in the southern flank of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. And also, uh, it is a venue for the competition between uh, China and Taiwan. So, uh, you know, the, uh, there are uh, very important and uh, important, uh, you know, uh, possibility uh, between uh, 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 Japan and uh, Australia in security terms. And next one, Taiwan. Japan's awareness of uh, the importance of Taiwan is uh, increasing. And uh, the uh, national security strategy says that peace and stability uh, or across the Taiwan Strait is in, uh, a dispensable element for the security and prosperity of the international community. And also says Taiwan is an extremely important partner and a precious friend of Japan. Actually, these statements are not new, uh, but the question is how these recognitions will put into action. Uh, also, uh, Japan's geographical proximity uh, to Taiwan binds Japan's security with that of uh, uh, Taiwan. So if uh, Japan has to be well prepared for Taiwan contingencies, uh, security cooperation between Japan and Taiwan will be uh, inevitable. Uh, of course, as uh, someone in uh, panel one said, uh, all these uh, you know, cooperation should uh, uh, do not have to be uh, you know, the public, of, uh, you know, quiet cooperation is necessary and useful. But um, the, uh, uh, in my mind, uh, further expansion of uh, the existing uh, framework, like you know, global uh, training and cooperation framework, uh, GCTF, uh, first created by uh, the United States and Taiwan, then it is already expanded to include uh, Australia and uh, Japan. Uh, should this uh, you know, framework should include hardcore security uh, cooperation, uh, uh, I think uh, it might be an idea to expand uh, uh, cooperation with Taiwan. 
Thank you, Lisa. You have the last word. Great. I will be quick because I don't want to hold people back from the lovely reception <laughs> that we're waiting for. But I'm so glad you asked about AUKUS. Uh, I spent Monday and Tuesday in a roundtable on AUKUS with uh, the Australia Strategic Policy Institute and King's College London. Um, and this AUKUS is an important part of this um, uh, you know, regional security architecture that we're trying to, to work toward. Um, and I think Japan has been supportive. Um, and there is a role for Japan, uh, and that's in pillar two of the AUKUS um, agreement, which is the pillar dealing with uh, greater cooperation on advanced capabilities, things like hypersonics, undersea capabilities, um, AI, quantum, uh, technologies. So uh, now that Pillar 1 or the optimal pathway for Pillar 1 has been announced and we see that it's going to be many, many years before uh, we actually reach the stage of Australia uh, producing um, nuclear-powered submarines, although the U.S. is committed to transferring um, at least three Virginia-class uh, nuclear-powered submarines by uh, 2032, which is still seems like a long time away, but um, you know, the, this is something that, that takes a long time. But you know, we don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm not sure I agree with the 2027 time frame that we've heard from um, uh, the admiral um, on, on uh, you know, uh, when we might see a, a military um, situation in the Taiwan Strait, but. We, uh, you know, waiting 10 years from now, is, that's a long time. And so I think that means that we have to see progress on Pillar 2. So hopefully, you know, now that the, the Pillar 1 strategy has been laid out, the roadmap's laid out, it's time to pivot quickly to how are we going to fill out that Pillar 2. And that is going to bring in Japan, I think, very quickly into that, um, into that agreement. Um, so, yeah, so I think, um, you know, I don't think we're going to start calling it jaucous, but, <laughs> but Japan will be part of that pillar, too. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you all. Um, you've all demonstrated very eloquently that um, uh, a networked regional security architecture is already advancing uh, in many ways. Uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So stay tuned because uh, the papers from all eight of our scholars will be published by CSIS in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we really hope that, that they provide a foundation for more dialogues like this heading into the future. So I'm afraid we're out of time. But those of you who stuck with us in person, thank you. Uh, we will give you an opportunity to interact with our panelists in a moment uh, out in the foyer. Suzuki-san, thank you so early. Uh, we really appreciate you being a part of this and, and joining us from, from Tokyo. And, and thanks again. Please join me in thanking our terrific panelists. <laughs>